Hi, it's awesome to be bringing you the very first podcast of Security in Focus. I'll be discussing the hottest topics in physical security with experts from the industry. My name's Steve Bell. I'm Chief Technology Officer at Gallagher Security. I've spent more than 30 years developing physical security products, and my goal is to make the world a safer place. I have a particular interest in the very top end of security, where we're protecting the really big stuff. How secure is your security? Hashtag security of security. The focus for this podcast is authentication, and today I have three guests. The first is Andrew Scodden, who is Chief Architect at Gallagher Security, and I talked to Andrew about what do we mean by authentication. The second is Dr. Rolf Lindemann, who is Vice President of Product for Knock Knock Labs. Knock Knock is one of the founding members of the FIDO Alliance. The third is Adam Boileau of Insomnia Security. We use Insomnia Security to pen test our products each time we do a release. I'm talking with Andrew Scodden, who's Chief Architect at Gallagher here. Andrew, can you tell us a little bit about um, authentication and how it relates to identity and authorization? The way it interacts with identity and authorization is that they tend to go together to make a decision about what someone's allowed to do within a product or service. So identity is the actual claim of who someone is. So one of my identities uh, would be saying, I am Andrew Scothin. Then I need to use authentication to prove that that really is me, that is my identity. And lastly, authorization says, having proven that I am who I say I am, what does that allow me to do in the product or service? Okay, and um, do you have an example that helps show the, the differences between them? Uh, yeah, sure. I think a good example which everyone can uh, relate to is credit cards. So most people have a credit card, um, and on that credit card it will have your name and it will have a credit card number. And so effectively that credit card is an identity. It is a claim about you. It says this credit card belongs to Andrew Scothin. So I use that. When I'm using that at a, a point of sale, so I'm making a purchase, I will present that card and I'll, often it will then be asking me, well, can you prove this really is your card? And be asking you for a pin or if the card is actually a virtual card on your phone, it might be asking you to present your finger on the fingerprint reader on the phone. So that step then is going, that's the authentication step to say, yes, that really is my card. I've proven it based on the pin I entered or the fingerprint I've used. And then lastly, having presented and proved that that is me, there is now another step that's actually happening in the back-end systems that says, okay, well, that's definitely Andrew's credit card and it's definitely him using it. What's he? How much is he allowed to purchase? And so that is the authorization step that's happening in those back-end systems to say, yep, he really can buy he really does have $100 he can spend to make this purchase. Cool. And so you just mentioned PIN numbers here. So um, I've heard talk in the industry that they talk about um, for authentication, you have something that you you know, um, something that you possess, and something that you are. Can you explain the what all those mean? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And we can you can use the previous example uh, to illustrate that. So the, the something I have is a physical token. Well, it doesn't always have to be physical, I guess, but in general, it's a physical thing. In the case of the credit card, it is the credit card. That's the something I have. Just having that credit card is one way to authorize that I really am Andrew Scothin. So if I'm making a purchase, a lot of the pay wave type examples these days, if it's below a certain amount, it says the only proof you need is to own the card. So I've authorized... Um, in that case, the identity and the uh, um, authorization, uh, so the authentication is the sa- is the same card. So that's the something I have. The something I know is something that is not physical. It is something that only I know about. It's effectively a secret that uh, I can use to validate that I really am the person I'm claiming to be. So a PIN number is a good example of that. Uh, so is a password. These are things where I know it and therefore I can say, yes, this is the, an additional level of security that I can uh, use to 
confirm that that really is my identity. Uh, and lastly, something I have, uh, oh sorry, something I am, is tends to be uh, biometric. So we're talk, talking about a fingerprint, uh, an iris, a facial recognition, any of those sorts of things where I, I'm using that to authenticate that the identity is me by saying, and also here's my fingerprint, so it can't be someone else with this card. Cool, that all makes sense. And so when we're talking about opening doors, um, is it all exactly the same or are there any differences, do you think? So the, pro the process is, is the same. Uh, we have uh, different levels for, uh, for opening doors where you can use a card uh, by itself or you can use a card plus a pin or you can use a card plus a biometric. So effectively, you've got all the same options for getting through a door where you can, can it, it can be just something I have, the card. It could be something I have plus something I know, the card plus the pin. Or it can be something I have plus something I know plus something I am. So I present the card, I enter the pin, and then put my fingerprint on the reader. And then I've used all three of the types of uh, authentication to confirm that really is my identity before the system decides to let me in the door. Yep, and, and so we, we often call the card only as single factor and, and card plus pin is double factor or two factor and um, yeah, if you've got all three, then we call it triple factor. So yeah, thanks for that. So card technologies over time, you know, um, back in the early days when I first used uh, access cards, open doors, they were mag stripe cards, um, just like the, the stripe uh, that's on the back of credit cards still. Um, and we swiped that and, and the door would open. Um, and then we got the first prox cards. Um, that's just showing my age a bit here. Um, got the first prox cards. And um, then we've moved through to, to smart cards. And so how do they vary from the, the authentication point of view? Uh, so the, the, the process is largely the same. I think the main difference between the card technologies uh, at a general level is the level of security of our protection of the data on the card itself. So the card is making a claim to be a person and the older technologies, unfortunately, it is far easier to create a copy of that card. So if we look at the things like 125, uh, um, uh, My Fair Classic, uh, the, uh, mag a lot of the MagStripe top technologies, very, very easy with uh, commercially available tools for someone to get a copy of that card, create a version of it themselves, and then use that to get through a door. So the security is weak because it is very easy to create a copy of the card that still looks like it's the real card. Uh, so the real advantage of the, of the later technologies, uh, like uh, Desfire, um, et cetera, uh, is that they are far, far, well, they haven't been cloned. There is no evidence that they've been cloned, and therefore you can feel more confident that when one of those cards is presented, that it is the real card. Uh, still, combining with additional factors gives you the additional level of security, even in that state, if if that additional factor is not on the card itself. So if those factors are on the card, um, then, yeah, if they, and they are able to be cloned, then your level of protection is not so great. Cool. Okay. Um, and look, one, one thing that um, doesn't seem to have happened very much in the industry and is about having a card that will get me into any building that I might need to get access to. And so it's that whole interoperability question. Now, um, you know, there's the US government have created their, their smart card for government that we often refer to as PIV cards, and that has interoperability. Maybe you could start by telling us a bit about how they uh, assure security in that situation. And then maybe if you could go on and just sort of talk about why you think maybe... Um, our security industry hasn't all got together and, and created one card that will do everything and work everywhere. Yeah. So the uh, the PIV cards are a really good example where, it, you know, one of these central identities needs to be backed by a well-trusted um, issuing authority. So for the PIV cards, they're backed by the, the, the US government. So they've got, there's a lot of trust that the cards that they're issuing 
uh, have been done in a robust manner and that no one can get in and reissue a card for someone else. So they're effectively creating a uh, a, tr a trusted card. Um, they've got certificates on the card that prove that the person is who they say they are. And then there is a mechanism for that card to be, which can't be tampered or cloned, to be enrolled into the systems and linked to an identity within each of those access control systems. So what that then allows is that card to be effectively used across multiple systems or multiple sites. Uh, it really does require, uh, as I said, a, a trusted a trusted vendor, trusted platform to do the issuing, someone the entire industry can get behind. And it also requires uh, some sort of uh, standard which enforces people to need to support that credential. So one of the biggest challenges, I guess, in the security industry uh, is that, uh, you know, there have been many card technologies in the past, uh, each vendor may implement um, different ways of using those card technologies, and therefore there is no one way that the entire industry uses these things, which makes it very hard to get everyone to agree and be on the same page about using uh, one credential type that everyone could use everywhere. Unfortunately for the customer, that, that's not so great. Uh, so really to, to move that that forward, it is going to require a, a whole of industry movement to to ex try and agree on a standard that all vendors can adopt and accept, and that customers need to provide the pressure, or or governments or standard industries provide the pressure to force vendors to move in that direction. Yeah, that that will be uh, interesting to see if if we can all in this industry get together and do that. Um, yeah. Okay, and um, so normally, of, well, often in the industry where, or in life really, where security gets better, um, it gets much less usable and uh, much harder to use. And um, so as we're going through an improve, improving security of things, um, passwords and things, you know, is there any, uh, is there any way you can see that it's actually going to get easier rather than harder every time we try and make things more secure? Yeah, so I think you've hit on a really important point there, Steve. Uh, one of the biggest barriers to secure security in general, uh, historically, has been that it keeps, as security gets stronger, usability gets worse, which encourages people to find ways to work around the security or to do things that mean that while the security of that individual thing is is good, overall security gets worse because they start writing down passwords or they start reusing passwords because password complexity rules are, are too complicated, which is, you know, a, a, I guess an example most people can, can relate to. So there does need to be a lot of thought into how do we make it so that security is really good, but also really easy for the end user. So biometrics potentially have a have a large part to play in this space. If we can get you know reliable, um, you know low false positive, uh, low false negative uh, results with biometrics, um, that gives you something that is very easy for an end user to use. But then there are a whole bunch of privacy considerations around uh, around biometrics that you know make people nervous. So as an industry, you know we need to, we need to improve. How, how we handle those and there's been a lot of progress in that in that space yeah I guess we've talked about the security of the cards and things is there are there any other factors that um, we should be thinking about in when we are a user of a system you know if you've got a card that lets someone act as you uh, you sort of do need to make sure you know you treat that seriously you wouldn't you wouldn't leave your credit card lying around. Um, where anyone else could pick it up, and you sort of need to treat this your your you know physical security credential in the same way. It's sort of the same with uh, with the pins. Say you've got uh, you reuse a pin for some loyalty card. I can't imagine a loyalty card that would use a pin, but let's go with that example. Um, you really don't want to use the same pin because then if that system which won't care about security as much gets compromised, and somehow they are able to get the pin off that then they can potentially reuse that on the physical security system so so things you can do are to try you know look, look after your credentials uh, don't reuse 
secrets uh, between different systems, especially between systems that probably aren't that secure and systems that do have a high level of security. Yep. So that's cool. Hey, there's lots of things in there for us, each each one of us to consider really when looking at that. Look, um, Andrew, I think that's been great. It's been great to have a chat to you on about this. And I think um, um, I'll look forward to talking to you again in a future podcast. Knock Knock Labs is a leader in the creation of new authentication technology. They're a founder member of the FIDO Alliance. I talked to Dr. Rolf Lindemann, Knock Knock's VP of product. I started by asking him to tell me a little bit about Knock Knock Labs. Knock Knock was founded in 2012 and the, the mission of our company is really to change the way authentication works. And that was the reason we were founded. I, Ramesh Gesanapani, the founder of Knock Knock and also the one who got the FIDO line going is really the one which got it all started. He worked for validity sensors at that time and realized that the authentication on the internet is broken. Right? The things we are doing there do not scale, first, not from a security perspective, and that's what we have seen with passwords, right? And second, if you look at all the alternatives to that, like um, OTP tokens, etc., they don't scale from an economic perspective. And so you, they realized that not a single company can fix that problem and it needs an alliance. And that was it's really the starting point of the FIDO line and of Not Not Labs at the same time. Um, Not Not Labs, as I said, one of the uh, inventors of the FIDO standard and the founder of the FIDO line, he contributed the initial specification which later became FIDO UAS version 1.0. And our platform is also the first authentication uh, speed, uh, to be commercially deployed using five authentication uh, protocols, and that was early in 2014. Passwords are one of the most painful daily experiences I have to go through every day, uh, and getting them right, and, and uh, the occasional having to get the, the IT group group to uh, reset my password so I can try again. You're, you're telling me that passwords are broken. Um, can you tell us a bit more about that? The server needs to know your password for verification. Right? So they need to store the password in, in one way or the other. Right? Uh, traditionally, they started with storing it in plain text, then they started to encrypt it. Now they start storing a hash. But however you do that, attackers which can hack into your server typically find a way that you, you shouldn't reuse one password across multiple sites. Right? That's just the, the result of that. Because if one site gets attacked, Right, the other side would be affected as well. Right, in some way, it is the, the, the weakest implementation will get attacked, right, and all the other, right, which might protect the password sort of the server side in a better way, are still affected. Right, so this creates a burden for the user now to use different passwords for different sites, which creates a usability issue because we cannot remember all the different passwords for the different accounts. I think. On average, people have more than 90 accounts, but I personally have more than 500 accounts. No way for me to remember 500 different passwords. The second security issue that calls the phishing or man in the middle attack, right, where you typically get a phishing email first, right, for someone to then start a man in the middle attack on you, meaning um, put, making sure you are opening a web page which is loaded from a man in the middle which looks like a legitimate web page, so you are willing to enter your credentials into that, right? And then everything is gone. Yes, yeah, so there is definitely a, a usability problem with um, strong passwords and remembering those and remembering lots of them. And um, there's also that problem of, as you mentioned, the, um, the secrets or the passwords stored at the server in some form. Um, how does FIDO go about solving these problems? Finally, we recognize and acknowledge the fact that there always need that needs to be a local helper device. And we gave it a name and say this is what we call an authenticator. And let's think about the characteristics of that authenticator. Right? It's the authenticator in the middle of the, of the uh, transaction somehow um, splits the transaction into two pieces in the communication chat. The first is a local interaction between the user and the user's authenticator. And the second is a remote communication between the authenticator and the server. If the authenticator remains in our position, it's on our phone um, or our computer or even a hardware token. 
So position is one authentication factor, and the second is a biometric, um, and that can be a face uh, biometric or a fingerprint biometric. And if your device doesn't have that uh, capability, then it can be a PIN number. And if it is a PIN number, then the great thing is that it's the same PIN number across all your accounts on that device. And so that makes it really hard to forget. When logging in, the biometric or PIN does not need to be sent to the server. And so that saves any privacy issues. When you use a face or fingerprint biometric, it unlocks access to the private key stored on your authenticator and allows the server to confirm that that private key matches the public key it has stored. And once all that's done, um, you're logged in. We're using public key cryptography to make sure that the server only needs a public key, right, and not a private key, meaning there is no secret to be stored in big databases on the server side. It's only public information, meaning public cryptographic keys to be stored by servers. That's great that there are no secrets for attackers to steal off of servers. How about the usability improvements? What can you do to make payments easier? And if you have experienced a payment where you just put your finger on a sensor, right, and this is, is considered strong customer authentication, right? In that case, you see that the card abandonment will really go down dramatically, right? The user experience goes up, card abandonment goes down. So what is one of the main outcomes from the FIDO Alliance work over the last few years? The Alliance is really there to help us to, to get the adoption, right? To get all the device manufacturers to support that, that standard and put new, these authenticators right into the device the users already have, which was done by Microsoft with Windows, by Google with Android, and now by Apple with iOS. Thanks, Rolf, for joining me to explain the latest improvements with authentication. I have one last question for you. What makes you optimistic about the future of secure and simple logons? The buy-in of, of the platform vendors right, and those large entities, the leaders of the world, which, which have um, deployed FIDO already, we are, we are now seeing that critical mass to, to say, yes, let, let's do the FIDO, um, FIDO approach right, um, and deploy passwordless authentication um, to all our, of our customers. Right, so that, that's the, I see that, that, that momentum. Right. Second, I see the impact, and the impact is really that we change the security equation on the internet. Right? It's in the past with, with the passwords, right, and all these band aids we have added to augment the lack of security that passwords give us. Right? And we have seen that we were with all the approaches we have done only a half of a step ahead of the attacker. Right? And it's always a, a arms race in some way where with, with this new technology, we are really way ahead. We are changing the way the competition works, right? The competition between the attackers and the, and the good guys, which come up with this great solution. So now we are way ahead, right? And the attackers have to refocus. Thanks very much, Rolf. Um, thank you. Thank you. My next guest is Adam Boileau, who is Principal Consultant at Insomnia Security. Hey Adam, what is the easiest way for a hacker to break into a system? So I mean, when you're attacking a, a system uh, or attacking an organization, one of the things you want to do is not get caught. Um, and the best way to not get caught is to do the least different from usual. You know, anytime you do something that causes the system to stop working or it makes someone go, hey, that looks weird or strange, you're more likely to get caught, it's more likely to go wrong. And so as an attacker, what you're looking for is what's the thing that's closest to normal that I can do that gets me in and lets me you know, act on my objectives. Um, and by and large, that's going to be pretending to be a real person who has legitimate access ideally using their legitimate credentials, right? If I know someone's username and password and I can log into their webmail from the outside, you know, from a country that they would normally come from, that's very, very close to normal. And so attacking systems as an authenticated user rather than using, you know, technical, you know, there's all sorts of technical wizardry that you can use, you know, security vulnerabilities and flaws and weaknesses and software. And hackers who do it for intellectual curiosity really value those things. But if you're a workaday attacker, you just want to get the job done, you know, fill in your reports, you know, get your timesheet done, go home at the end of the day, you know, you really care about doing it in the way that works, right? It doesn't have to be fancy, it's just got to, it's just got to work. Uh, and having credentials and just logging in, uh, you know, using the existing authentication, the existing remote access, existing security controls, you know, in a way that they're normally used is 
totally the best approach. And when we break into an organization, you know, once we're in and we have to go and figure out, you know, how do we get to, I mean, say, for example, you're trying to break into a building physically and you want to clone an access card, you want to understand where's the Gallagher Control Center, find the person who looks after the physical security, watch them do the job, figure out how they log into it, steal their password from their keyboard while they type it in, and then log in, right? And at that point, you don't have to find any exotic vulnerabilities. So authentication is just super important. It's the most valuable target for us is centralized authentication, people's passwords. And if they've got multi-factor authentication involved, finding a way to get around that um, is one of the main things that we end up doing. So it's, it's really the crux of so much um, of how we intrude into systems and then how we operate once we're inside. Okay, so passwords suck. I'm regularly getting IS to unlock my account because I can't get my password right. What other techniques do attackers employ to get users' passwords? If you're operating in an environment where the only thing that's between an attacker and the inside of the environment or the thing that you're trying to protect is one password, uh, then you're going to have a bad time because inevitably someone is going to have that password be welcome one. You know, that's set by the service desk when they started and they never used the account because they didn't log into that system or it's, you know, some other, you know, common word um, or common thing. Um, you know, a very, very useful technique that we have, you know, is just guessing passwords, right? I mean, if I know someone's username and I log in and I try password one, password two, Monday one, welcome one, you know, summer 20, whatever, we're up to winter 20 now. Um, if I can do that, then it'll get me in if that's the only thing required. Now, if we've had controls like, you know, if you try more than three passwords and your account gets locked, which is a great control, it's specifically designed to stop me guessing. But what we do is we then go, okay, well, I'm going to get the list of you know, 5,000 staff who work here, and I'm going to try, you know, Monday one against all of them. I'm going to try one password per each account. I'm not going to lock out any of them, and someone's password is going to be Monday one or welcome one or whatever. So I can do that kind of horizontal brute force. Now, there's just always going to be someone's password that's weak. Wow, that sounds way too easy. So what's a better way? So multi-factor authentication where you've got something else, you know, uh, um, you know, at worst, an SMS, you know, a text message to your phone with a code that you have to type in. It's inconvenient, it's clunky, has a lot of things wrong with it, but it's absolutely better than nothing. Um, and as an attacker, you know, anytime we see a multi-factor authentication option, it really causes us grief um, because, one, we don't know it. Uh, two, if it's the sort of multi-factor authentication where, say, you get a text message or you get a push notification to your phone through an application like uh, you know, Duo or Microsoft's Authenticator or something, um, if you get a push notification, you're going to go, hey, that's weird. I didn't log in. Why am I getting a push? Maybe you go ask if, you know, someone over in the service desk, you report it. You know, it'll, as an attacker, we don't know who's being notified when we hit a multi-factor authentication problem. So it has two, two real important values. Like one is we don't have to have two things to know to get in. And two, it, it increases the chance that we're going to get caught. So regardless of which option for multi-factor authentication you use, it really does cause us trouble. Um, and there's some types of multi-factor authentication, the FIDO style, you know, U2F token system that we can't even really get in the middle of to be able to, you know, do some of the more technical attacks. You know, other things like the ones where you have to receive a code and then type it in, you know, we've got techniques for getting in the middle of that and kind of, you know, you know uh, uh, taking over that authentication process. But for something like, um, you know, a, a strong one like the U2F tokens, uh, we are just, we're screwed. We have to find another option for that point. Hey, it's great to see that multi-factor evens up the playing field. I know that guards sharing a password is pretty common. Now, I've heard of an instance where the complex password is stored in a file on the desktop and cut and pasted into the logon dialog. Another common sharing scenario is all the staff in the school sharing the same PIN for the alarm systems. So, Adam, how easy does sharing passwords make it for the hacker? One of the key things, that, one of the key tricks that you learn as a young hacker is find the manual and find what the default password is. You know, anywhere where credentials are shared, they are shared through some medium. Sometimes they're defaults that are in the manuals or the installer guides. I mean, anytime we see a domestic alarm panel, you just got to go, you know, Google the manufacturer, find the installer guide. Anywhere where there's shared credentials, you know, where they're used um, by multiple people gives us, as an attacker, an opportunity to find those credentials. The example from you know, very topically was uh, Twitter got compromised, you know, had a bunch of accounts compromised very recently. Uh, as I understand it, the origin of that was they had a, an admin credential in a pinned message in their Slack chat system. And so some got access to Slack, you know, because access to Slack probably doesn't mean, you know, it's not that important. But there was an admin credential for Twitter's backend systems in a pinned message because shared credential. So anywhere where it's shared, it gives me an opportunity to find it through the medium that it's shared. Credentials being shared, you know, has a whole bunch of impacts beyond just the fact that they're shared. Yep, so everyone should have their own logon. 
We're pretty much glued to our mobile phones these days. System vendors like us are creating mobile phone apps to open doors. There is horror stories about the security of mobile phones. How do you see it? So there's a few trade-offs there. Um, I mean, on the one hand, mobile, modern mobile devices are, uh, you know, especially if you've got a, you know, up-to-date Apple phone, up-to-date, you know, Google, um, uh, one of the Google, like actual Google-produced phones, as opposed to you know a, a Samsung or you know some other knockoff Android. Um, if you've got one of those devices, then they are pretty good as modern you know computers go. I mean, as a by virtue of being a general-purpose computer with really strong physical controls, biometric authentication by virtue of you know fingerprint or face authentication or something to unlock the phone. So there's a bunch of reasons why phones are really good at providing you know first-line security against physical you know physical access or um, like the use of an app store to install software, so there's a more controlled software supply chain versus a general purpose desktop computer. So there's a number of reasons why mobile phones are quite good places to store authentication information, you know, compared to, you know, a, a prox card, which you can leave on the bus, or, you know, someone can take out of your wallet. Like a mobile phone, if someone takes it and they want to then go and log into the, you know, uh, access a building through a, a token stored on your phone, they've still got to unlock the phone somehow. So it kind of adds an extra depth of control, which is really good. On the other hand, those phones are often personal property. Like they bring your own device things. Sometimes they're not owned by the company. So the amount of control that the company can um, enforce upon those uh, is a bit restricted. So the ability, for example, to remote wipe a phone uh, if it's been lost or stolen, you know, most people don't want that on their personal phone. They don't want to give the company the ability to throw out your kids' photos on your phone, right? So there's a, a few trade-offs there that um, are different. You know, revoking a lost one is more complicated in the mobile situation because you know, the phones are used for other things. They're not necessarily in your control. Um, but they are more robust in many respects than, a, you know, a straight-up access card that has no, you know, other factor other than I physically control it in my hand. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's good and bad. And, of course, when you have mobile phones that are not well-maintained, not patched, not updated, then there's a bunch of technical attack surface um, that I could use as an attacker to try and break into someone's phone, clone out the key material that's used to authenticate to the building, and then use that, you know, to effectively clone the authenticator in a mobile phone that's used for building access control. So there are, you know, there's more technical attack service, but compared to a card that you can lose, perhaps, you know, there are some some upsides as well. Adam, most of these phone apps are using Bluetooth to do the authentication with the door reader. Is Bluetooth up to the task? Is it something for the hacker to take advantage of? When you see some Bluetooth systems that are used for access control, they can vary from, you know, completely trivial, uh, where, you know, an attacker can just get near and unlock them. And we see this with... Um, you know, if you go to onto Amazon and you buy one of those like domestic doorknobs, you know, sort of electronic doorknobs that has a Bluetooth thing, by and large, those are all absolutely terrible. Um, and anyone who gets near it can just unlock it. All the way through to very robust systems where, you know, if you're using the same sort of um, authentication as you would with um, NFC, you know, uh, proximity cards that use cryptographic certificates and things like you'd see on, on high-end smart card, you know, proximity card systems, you can absolutely run the same protocol across the Bluetooth transport and get at least the same security, if not better, uh, because of some of the other aspects of the Bluetooth um, protocol. So it really, there is a lot of variation. And that's one of the things as a consumer, as someone purchasing or using this technology, it's completely opaque to you which end of the spectrum you're getting, right? And it's very much up to the brand of the manufacturer and the reputation of that manufacturer and your trust in them as to how much work they've done on implementing it correctly. Yeah, we definitely take the security of this stuff really seriously. So Adam, with all the improvements in authentication technology and people being aware of the issues, have you got good cause for optimism? The rate of change of technology overall, the rate, the rate that we're bolting computers into absolutely everything, I think exceeds the rate of improvement for authentication. <laughs> so, you know, overall things are worse, although in some areas, you know, and specifically authentication uh, and to a certain extent software supply chain, you know, we have a much better understanding than we ever have. And we are in a much better position um, to be able to defend, you know, important systems than we would have been you know, five, ten years ago when, as an attacker, I mean, really it was a lot easier. Uh, so it feels harder to me now to attack things than it used to be, uh, but you know, things are still bad. Thanks, Andrew, Rolf and Adam for joining the discussion on authentication. So in summary, here's some takeaways. The first is that passwords are the weakest link. It requires people to create secure passwords, keep them secret, and the secrets are also stored on servers somewhere so they can be attacked by hackers. Today, there are new authentication standards that can solve these problems. No secrets to be lost, and the usability is way better. The third takeaway 
is that most of the tokens in use today for opening doors are not very secure and can be cloned at almost no cost. I hope you found our security and focus podcast valuable and I'd love to have your feedback to help us improve this podcast series. So let's continue the discussion on LinkedIn. If you'd like to find out more about Galho's approach to security and authentication, visit our website security.galho.com.